Okay. Right, getting that set up. We said thanks for being with us tonight um, for this edition of Not the Museum Thursday night. Our ongoing work that we are doing to uh, uh, bring some history to you during this time of COVID. Um, it's uh, I think we've done some great great interviews in the past, uh, and we've got some great programming coming up. Tonight, I'm very excited to bring you tonight's webinar with someone that I respect and I've had a pleasure to work with closely over the years in many different capacities. Um, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge that the Niagara region of Ontario is located in the traditional shared territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and the Chinatown peoples. The Chinatown people have called these lands home for thousands of years, and more recently, the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee have been sharing the land as one dish, one spoon, treaty territory. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Clark Burnett. I'm the Culture Museums Manager for the City of Niagara Falls, and I'm very happy to bring you tonight's program. Uh, bear with me as I do my best to check the questions, moderate the discussion, and also do all the technical aspects. So I hope it goes well, but I will say I almost always forget something, and I've got to check to see if my staff are telling me that I actually got the Facebook Live going right. So, um, so if you have questions for tonight, tonight uh, we have Jim Hill in. And I'll introduce him in a second from the Niagara Parks Commission. If you have questions along the way, we'd like you to use the Q&A function and a feature on Zoom if you're following us on Zoom. Um, do questions along the way. I'm going to take a break uh, at some point, ask some of the questions probably midway through. Uh, feel free to ask. There is also a chat feature and somebody's already chimed in there. So hi, welcome in and thanks for joining us. I'm not going to be looking at the chat very often. Uh, for questions. I'd like you to use the Q&A for questions because uh, there's only so many things this guy can do. The other thing is if you're joining us on Facebook Live, I will attempt to check some questions there, but I'm not promising anything because that might be one step too far for this guy. So, um, but uh, I will try and take a look at that or also I make my circle back later on uh, to answer some questions later on. So, um, you know, the one thing is that, that I would say about the chat and the, and the questions that you're asking right now, I did ask Jim here um, to stay, you know, and, and for your questions to stay on the side that Jim's sort of the expert on. And Jim, if you don't know, it is an expert on a lot of great things on, on uh, Niagara Parks Commission and Niagara history. Um, so there's a lot that he knows, but I want you to start to say the question, keep the questions on the heritage side and history side of things. Um, certainly contemporary issues on the heritage issue are, are fair game, but um, you know, I know a lot of people out there are passionate and for very good reasons. The Parks Commission holds a very important role within our community and the landscape of our community. Um, and you have very passionate uh, views on the role that they play and what they do or what they don't do in your opinion. Um, trying to stay away from those. Um, Jim doesn't control the parking or the fees or those types of things. There's, there's another complaint department for that, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, you know, try and keep the questions within the heritage sphere of things. Um, as we go along. And, and we've actually had some earlier questions in that, that dabble in those areas that actually I think Jim will get into uh, um, where you if you have questions about certain things, how you go about that. So, so like I said, very happy to welcome uh, our guest tonight. I will say I've got a bit of, I put together a bit of a slideshow. Jim gave me some pictures. I pulled some pictures from our collection um, of things we thought we might touch on. Um, we might go off of a, it's not really a presentation or a PowerPoint or a slideshow. It's more just to sort of provide some pretty pictures uh, so you don't have to look at us uh, the whole time and also to help elaborate on some of the details as well. So, so that's it for me for the preamble, um, except for the introducing and welcoming Jim Hill, who is the Senior Manager of Heritage for the Niagara Parks Commission, a position he has held since 2005. Uh, before that, from 1996 to 2005, he worked at Old Fort Erie uh, and did not give me a job one summer. And before that period, worked at Fort George. You might not even remember that. Uh, worked at Fort George and Brock's Monument as a student. Uh, Jim is responsible for four staff locations and the markers, monuments, and plaques on the commission property stretching along the entire length of the Niagara River. Uh, Jim is also a captain in the Reserve Army and lives in the city of Niagara Falls within Earthshot of the Roar of Niagara and within Musket Shot of Lundy's Lane and with his wife, Jeannie, and their children, Jack and Amelia. And you might see uh, Jim, I think, is in his basement. His lighting is not the best, but he is somewhat hiding from Jack and Amelia because he does have some kids on the go that, uh, um, uh, that uh, certainly uh, play a role in this world of uh, Zoom and team meetings. So 
So anyways, I'd like to welcome Jim to the, the uh, tonight at Not at the Museum Thursday night. And welcome, Jim. Hi, Clark. How are you? Great. And uh, we got the first thing through that we didn't mute yet, and I'm muted at the wrong time. And I'm going on the, on the third page of questions already. So Jim, th thanks for joining me again. Uh, for those who don't know Jim, uh, he, like I said at the beginning, he knows a lot of stuff. He's a great talker. Um, we're going to try and keep this nice and concise and... Uh, um, but he is uh, knowledgeable in a whole lot of things. But let's start with your background, where you come from. You know, I read your bio, but maybe go in a little bit more detail. Like, you know, was a summer job before you had started you, or were you always passionate about history? You know, maybe get into a little bit of that. Uh, well, uh, I grew up in the metropolis of Jordan Station, which is uh, <laughs> actually a fantastic place to grow up. So may maybe not uh, that metropolitan, but... Uh, yeah, fantastic place. And then later moved into St. Catharines um, when I was in high school. Um, and I think, sadly, almost every school I've ever gone to, except for one now, has closed. Uh, that doesn't bode well for Brock University because that was <laughs> the only one that's left that I've attended. So they, they've, they've amalgamated a lot of these little country schools over the years. And my mom was just a big history buff. Like she dragged us to everything uh, plaques, uh, uh, historic houses, uh, and she she just loves storytelling too. And she was a writer for a while. She actually uh, won some awards and, and made a little bit of money to make a down payment on a house, even with some of her writing. Making money in the arts. <laughs> so way to go, way to go, mom. So she's the one who really uh, uh, got gave me that history kind of uh, bug. And then I I had a couple little jobs as a kid. Uh, but I realized uh, uh, that they hired guys, at uh, teenagers at Fort George. So I applied. I volunteered there for a little bit, and then I applied. And I think one of the questions was, can you name some of the regiments that served at Fort George? And finally, the two interviewers said, okay, you can shut up now. <laughs> we got it. Because I just kept going and going and naming. Uh, okay, that's good enough. Once you get to three, that's, that's all we were. It also comes detrimental. You almost know too much. Yeah, you sort of become a creepy, creepy, uh, creepy, uh, creepy snotty kid. Yeah, the, do we really want to work with this kid all summer? Uh, so in between flying gliders and airplanes with cadets, I worked at Fort George as a kid and then kind of came back to, to it later on when I was in school and worked at Brock's Monument for a couple summers. And then, um, yeah, did a bit of traveling and bumbled around a little bit. And then uh, I think it was an ad in the Niagara Falls Review. And a friend of mine, Actually, his wife called me up and said, there's an ad that describes you. And they were looking for somebody to be a supervisor at Old Fort Erie. And uh, I knew I was up against people with way more formal education and way more military experience. And I thought, oh, it's not going to go anywhere. And, uh, and that was 20, almost 20. That was 25 years ago, actually. This fall, I think they interviewed me. So, yeah, still here. <laughs> <laughs> Just move along. That's yeah. great. And, and so, you know, so that gives us a bit of background. You know, you've been in this for a long time and, and did the living history stuff. And again, the Parks Commission really is a living history um, experience, I guess, in the Niagara River. Um, let's maybe sort of go, dig into that, that history, the, the Parks Commission. So, you know, and, and then we'll move into the historic sites because I don't think they're a part of the beginning. So maybe talk like Parks Commission starts, you know, 1885-ish, 1880s. That's What's right. going on in Niagara? Why, why is this happening? Well, as we talked about before, there's this great history that some of the people listening or watching tonight probably know as well as you, you and I do about this wild west town. Uh, things were getting a little crazy and, uh, and, and competing interests were setting fire to their stairwells down into the gorge or blowing them up and people were getting shot or shot at. Uh, and, but I always like to bl blame Grover. Uh, not blame American. Not the Muppet, and being a good Canadian, always blame an American. So uh, Grover Cleveland was a governor of New York, and there's a lot of people involved. Pretty impressive folks. Lord Dufferin, you know, chimes in and thinks, you know, that you have to save this place. Um, and Olmsted is involved. There's, there's this whole thing coming around is North America urbanizes more. The people need parks. Yeah, they need national to national park us. movement. Yeah. Yeah, and it all kind of comes together all at the same, same time. So the Americans do beat us by a little bit. They create their park uh, first. 
uh, and we can kind of thank them because we have that great view of Goat Island, right? That it's been a state park uh, since the 1880s. So we, we came along, a little bit of a fight, but I think in the States it was easier. It was gonna be a state park. Nobody was really debating that. We're here, I think there was a bit of a fight between the federal government and the province. The province <laughs> loses the fight. And then, cause you're gonna have to displace people. In some cases, people had been here for- It's gonna cost money to do that. It's gonna cost money to do that. And guess what? We're not gonna give you any money. You've got to figure out how to uh, how to do this without uh, any uh, tax dollars from any level of government. So that's kind of you know the the challenge and the opportunity that the park has always had. That uh, we're a government entity. We answer to the people of Ontario and, and to the people of the communities along the river. So we're there to protect, but we also have to be we have to be self funded. So that's always been kind of a neat. Balancing the act. balancing act that you guys have to yeah. the, the tightrope walk you have to uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> pun intended throw, throw out all the cliches right <laughs> yeah so you 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 said the federals came kind of came to the table first is it, was it federal first well you know there there's a just because I think Lord Dufferin was involved so the Governor General of Canada was giving lots of speeches and, and the idea of creating this park this almost international space for people um, and again right around the same time Banff is created. I think that's our first national park writ large, like a big nature park. Um, so we have a little debate, friendly debate with the, the Parks Canada staff who came first, you know, did we beat them or, and it took a couple of years to really create the park and open it. So there's really a, th a three year lag between um, it, it being legislation and then an actual place you would visit with your, with your family. Well, it's way easier for us to remember 1888 as well. It just yeah. Rolls off so much nicer. <laughs> yeah, we've had a few uh, anniversaries over the years about well, when was it created and when was it opened and uh, and then it expands over time and that's really in the 1890s where you get this interest in in saving these old historic sites mm -hmm. and more markers go up. You know, the, the the Women's Literary Guild in St. Catharines. You know, their I think their real goal was the vote but they didn't want to be crass about it, but they sort of went around putting out markers and, and reminding people of these places. The people, I think some people anyway, didn't want to rehash history. So we, we think of the War of 1812 as kind of ancient uh, history, but the people in the 1880s, it wasn't that old. You know, it wasn't, it's a generation past, yeah. It was, yeah, there were people walking around who, who had experienced the Battle of Lundy's Lane. You know, so uh, it wasn't seen as as ancient history, and I think maybe the turn of the 20th century is when people really start realizing, hey, we got to save these these cool. Yeah, yeah, places. certainly it was a North America movement for sure. Along yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Look at historic sites across North America, for, yeah. sure. for sure. So, so they start expanding. So, so it started off as basically the Ni Niagara Niagara uh, Victoria Park. I'm sorry. That's and right. It was, it was growing, so it, it was pretty quickly. It starts growing up into. Uh, is it Fort to Fort at that point, or where you know? Yeah, it's sort of pockets. Exactly, that's fine, but that's sort of vaguely. You have, you have pockets of land, uh, and a lot of it is still a uh, military reserve at that point. Anyway. That's right. So it's Fort Erie. You know, it's okay. so. A lot of, in fact, all the land along the river was uh, called the Chain Reserve. So six, 66 feet from the water's edge, and that you know that really goes back to treaties with indigenous people that following the arrival or during the arrival of the loyalists, that basically this, okay, you can come here, people can settle <laughs> uh, and there'll be, this land will be used for, for mutual defense. You know, it's a lot, it's really a military pact, um, but it really reinforces. And I think the Niagara Parks Act uh, carries that on, that the river is important. The river has to be accessible to everyone. Uh, and for thousands of years, it's been transportation, drinking water, Fishing, irrigation, um, we just Our plants, yeah. energy. Yeah. That's right. So, the the river is everybody's. Everybody, nobody can put up a fence and say, "Hey, you know, this is my my river." No, it's everybody's and should be free and and open access. And then you bring your car and try to park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer to that is, you know. I don't want to. Be, I don't be glib about it. Don't bring your car. That's sort of the other answer. Ways to access this. Yeah. Go, go okay, do so what Clark Burnett does and, and go. That we weren't going to start on parking. So <laughs> go for 
go for a run like Clark Clark Burnett goes for a run. You go for a run through the park still, right? No, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. I'm past Clark Burnett. <laughs> so, you know, there's there's ways to enjoy the park. Uh, but I think most people know that if they, you pull your car over on the lawn somewhere on the parkway on a nice, nice afternoon day, and just sit out and enjoy the sun or bring a picnic. That's, you know, that's fine. That's, that's, that's what it's there for. Jim told me it's, it's okay. Okay, so, 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 you know, so it starts at Victoria Park, it grows up, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the quirky things that some people might not, not know, but as your role as senior manager heritage, what are, you know, what, what is, you know, so we know the parameters of what we're talking about tonight, what exactly does that encompass? It talks about, you know, you got four historic sites, you got, you got a fort, you got Fort Erie, mm -hmm. Mackenzie, let's see if I got them or a C chord, yeah. and McFarland, right? And McFarland, yeah. And those yeah. are four properties that you sort of staff and man. And That's right. What is markers, I think markers and monuments also encompass that. So Chippewa has got a monument. I know there's some, you know, there's Tesla, Tesla statue that-, that We do, yeah, yeah. So we, we've got, uh, oh, I think it's closer to 120 plaques or interpretive panels along the river now. And, and as we've talked about, Clark, and, and in your role too, for the size of the population of the communities along the Niagara River, there's a lot of stories to tell. You know, like a lot of communities in Ontario, uh, I'm not going to name any, not going to name any, but as you know, work's never boring. I mean, there's just every time the phone rings or you get an email, the questions are awesome. You know, so that becomes the challenge is being able to answer those questions and finding the sources to say this is, you know, this is where we're getting our, our information uh, from. We do have uh, a museum collection. We have an art collection that's uh, part of our responsibility. A little bit of the archives as well. Um, it's sort of a shared responsibility as well. So that's that's kind of it. But every day there's great questions we get from people. Uh, what's cool is if it comes if it comes through our staff, we got really smart people in lots of our departments. So by the time it gets to us, it's usually a pretty tough uh, question. Um, or just, we just don't have that depth of, uh, of, of knowledge. So I think I got asked for a while what the War of 1812 Bicentennial did for us. <laughs> and I said, well, <clears throat> in 2011, I'd get questions like, so the war started in 1812? That would be a question. You'd be like, yeah, it started in 1812. And by the end, thanks to the internet and genealogy sites and people digging up family history, you'd get questions like, so my great, 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 great grandfather served in the, one of the flank companies of the fourth Lincoln militia and he was wounded here and then he got a land grant and then, can you tell me any more about him? <laughs> no, 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 I think- You kind of got the story. <laughs> you just educated me, I know. So I think that's the other cool thing. I learn a lot from bumping into people who've really done a lot of homework and maybe we disappoint them that they're, they're teaching us. <laughs> yes. I, I, I found in my role as, as you know museums and curators is we're more about amassing what other people know absolutely people know, discovering yeah. these days because there's just again like you said Niagara is just a wealth of of stories and you know and, and, and to to you know for you guys to be in depth about every creek name and, and family you know the Usher's Creeks and the Black Creek you know all the different you know those types of things and you span a lot a lot of territory and a lot of space and uh, like I said, there's a lot of early families there to sort of be, uh, brush up on. So, or if you can guide people to those folks who who know the subject really well, see that's the other thing. You're not a, we're not always the ones that have the information, but we can we can point them in the right direction. So that's exactly. It's, it's at least knowing where to look. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So 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 you're responsible for those sites. I want to sort of still stay with it, some of the early stuff as well. Um, and look at how the, the Parks Commission amassed things. Like, like what was there a philosophy behind? Uh, some people don't know, I mentioned earlier about Fort George, you know, they may not be aware that the Parks Commission uh, ran the Battlefield House in Stony Creek, which I was, was a much younger person working at many years ago uh, in Stony Creek, which, you know, they have a name called Niagara Parks Commission, you know, and again, argue that it's part of the part of the story of Niagara maybe but uh, I guess and, and you ran a cemetery up the hill um, <laughs> I mean, uh, battlefield and cemetery Drummond Hill Cemetery which now the city of Niagara Falls runs was part of the Parks Commission so so you know that early phase what was what was the philosophies what was going on about you know 
the expansion and, and acquiring, and even the art collection, right? The, the art collection is quite, quite a, a task as well. So maybe go into some of those those stories. Yeah, back back to I think a lot of it is leadership, uh, different eras where financially or politically there was a will or interest or ability to do things. Uh, clearly, the 1930s is a, is an era where we build a, a lot or rebuild a lot on our property, um, and every, everything from the Queen's Nights restaurant to Fort George to the to the Mackenzie Printery, Fort Erie. These are all things that are that are either brought back to life or built um, as, uh, as make work projects. And to kind of create by then, you know, the parkway is complete. Like the, we think of the parkway as having always been there. Mm -hmm. A portion of, of, of the parkway really date from the 20s and 30s uh, where there wasn't really, a, there might've been a trail there, but not really much of a road because people went around Niagara Falls. You know, the road system went around it. It didn't, it didn't hug, the, uh, hug the gorge entirely. Um, so that, that's where you see these, uh, th this interest level. And really in the 30s and early 40s, it's T.B. McQuesten, right? So this, this guy is, uh, you know, he holds many different portfolios. He's the chair of the Niagara Parks Commission. He's the Minister of Transportation building the Queen Elizabeth Way. He's the chair of the Bridge Commission that builds the Rainbow Bridge. So here's a pretty powerful, important fella who's a history buff. Uh, and, and for a while, you know, he's a guy from Hamilton. So I think that's why places like uh, Battlefield House, uh, Lundy's Lane, uh, we really looked after every War of 1812 site in Niagara, with apologies maybe to Cook's Mills. Say Cook's Mills might be, but there's nothing to own there, I don't think. <laughs> and, beavers, and beaver dams and places like that, that, uh, that we weren't a, a part of that, but, but uh, he's the guy. And he hired a young grad student from Queens named Ron Way. Ron Way literally wrote the first history of the park. And uh, he went on to do big projects like uh, Upper Canada Village when the Seaway was going through in the 50s. And his last big project was Fortress Louisburg in Cape Breton. So when it comes to rebuilding or restoring uh, historic sites and staffing them with sort of a living history program, uh, in Canada anyway, Ron Way was the guy. You know, he was he was the one who sort of brought that about. Right, right. So they, they start amassing this eighteen twelve storyline, and and again, I guess then you start contracting at some point. Is it is it was there any um, wave of that, or is it just sort of Parks Canada sort of says we want to get involved in Fort George, and you know Stony Creek sort of says we'll take this back. You're not dealing with it. I'm sure it was sort of like, you know, I'm sure it was a local politician in Stony Creek saying we want it back. I would assume. I think a bit of that, um, and you know, how many forts and battlefields do you need? <laughs> that might be the other side of it too. But maybe we had a little more than we needed. But you know, we I think the Parks Commission can get credit for for looking after places maybe when other people couldn't or wouldn't. Absolutely. We move a little more uh, easily to to acquire these places. But yeah, we start moving away from some of these places. In the '70s and '80s, maybe there's sort of it's sort of seen as as uh, um, a different era, you know. Maybe we're going to move beyond that kind of stuff, and um, so that's when you see uh, in the '80s, uh, Battlefield House goes over to the town of Stony Creek, which of course is now the city of Hamilton. Uh, we still have good friends there and, uh, and hang out and help them out and vice versa. So the, the, the relationship. Yeah, it over probably. So. Yeah, yeah. Susan Ramsey was a Parks Commission employee when she first started. I wish I didn't know that actually. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So she's great. She has a great crew of people there. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of uh, the Stony Creek site. It's just, uh, and I, I feel that way uh, at Fort George. Like, yeah. I'm one of those weird people. I'm sure some of the people watching tonight are like, you get a warm feeling, you know, it's just sort of this, this, now some of the history of these places is pretty terrible if it's related to the war of 1812, but it's home, you know, it's sort of a, and you, and you're going to bump into the people who work there and the volunteers, like you just know the people involved really care about, about the story and about the places they're looking after. They're really passionate about it. And you kind of, you get joy from, from being around people like Sue Ramsey. So. Yeah, to keep on telling the story, you know, and again, we've yeah. all told all these stories repeatedly, but we tend not to get bored of it, do we? Because 
you know, or we find new, I always find, I find new things to talk about, right? You know, there's always something new about a property or a site that we can get excited about and, and pass that excitement on. Or look at it from a different perspective. You know, that's the other thing that maybe we haven't always captured every perspective on, on things. So an, another important guy who marked all of our sites, even in starting around 1919, was, uh, was Ernest Krushank, the first co-chair of the National Historic Sites and Monuments Board. And he was a Fort Erie boy, so he... he I was a Ridgeway boy, more, more so. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, you know, he grew up from Loyalist stock. So the first plaques he put out don't mention Americans uh, or the United States Army. They're, they're only listed, mentioned as invaders, and they can only do things like flee or hide, <laughs> crushed, right? So there's not a real, you know, maybe not a a balanced story there entirely for our American uh, friends who come across the, uh, the border. Uh, and I think too, there's other stories that in, in the past 30, 40 years, maybe we've got better at, at, at telling stories from an indigenous perspective or, or black history. Um, and, and I think that adds depth to what we, what we, uh, what we do. And then we've acquired places too. So in the 1990s, uh, 1998, uh, the Laura Secord Homestead, which had been looked after by the, the chocolate company, we, uh, we took that on. Also in the 1990s, the Chippewa Battlefield, uh, you know, was acquired by the, by the park. So we, as we sort of handed stuff off to others, we've also picked up uh, things. And, uh, and I've used an example of a, a conversation I had in New Orleans at their 200th anniversary of the Battle of New Orleans. And I was kind of playing uh, guest just in street clothes. I didn't dress up or anything. I was just sneaking around with some friends and somebody recognized me, terrible. And it was an American friend talking to another American said, oh, you gotta meet this guy, he's from Canada. And they really have done it right up there. Uh, I thought, oh, well, that's good. And as we were at this reenactment, which was in this big field behind a Walmart super center, that's where most of the public and the reenactors were. The actual National Historic Site, National Park Service site had something else going on. And then the state of Louisiana and the city of New Orleans had something else going on all at the same time. And, and I think we talked about the fact that when people came to the Lundy's Lane 200th or the Chippewa 200th or Fort George's 200th, uh, unless people knew who we were, they didn't know who we worked for, which maybe our employers won't be happy to hear. But we, we, uh, we teamed up, you know, so I got a lot of compliments for your hard work uh, or Peter Martin at Parks Canada's hard work. Uh, and eventually I would tell people, I would say, listen, you know, we're, we're just participants. Um, we're just helping out here. So that's kind of a nice feel, too, that there's an acknowledgement that regardless of what level of whether we're municipal or federal or provincial, we find a way to, to help each other tell these stories. You're always there. To, when I have an 1812 question, you're always there that I bug you all the time. So, but uh, uh, let's, you, you sort of mentioned about the, the later acquisitions by Laura Siegner and all that. We had a few questions. I actually had some questions come in earlier um, by one uh, person who I, I hope is uh, participating on the line. Um, and he was wondering about the Parks Commission. And you talked about, you know, acquiring Laura Siegner. I know lots of other properties have been offered to, you know, the Parks Commission over the years and over time. They were wondering about, you know, is there a process for acquiring historically significant process and how those decisions are made and whether, you know, whether you guys purchase properties and those types of things. So, so you know, is, and I guess, you know, you sort of answered about there's an ebb and flow, but I guess what's the process right now if, if you know, if somebody, you know, if, if there was something that we felt was significant to today, you know, what's, is there a process? Yeah, they, uh, the public does come to the commission and sometimes they're organized. So there have been committees citizens committees that have formed to petition the government and the, and and the, and, the, and directly to the parks commission to try to save or protect or preserve something the chippewa battlefield might be a good example of that coming together so there was a community group uh an interested landowner uh and an interested commission who just seemed like the right thing to do to uh to protect and preserve a piece of parkland that had a significant event that took place uh, on it and there are these sort of up properties that come up from time to time that are discussed and debated and and uh, but it's ultimately up to the commission as staff we can we can offer input um i think 
in general, we've, we've focused on the river corridor more and more. Uh, so people might remember, like you mentioned, uh, Stony Creek, but you know, we had, uh, um, we had parkland in Jordan, uh, as well. Uh, that was like a campground, uh, Charles Daly park. Uh, but that's now the town of Lincoln has, has taken that over as well. So I think a lot of the focus has been on the river and, and that continuity from, from Fort Erie to Niagara Lake. But if people have suggestions, you know, we get requests and, and. You guys uh, were close to one moving on to Laura Secord at one point, weren't you? So. Yeah. Uh, that's the other thing. It's not just uh, property, but buildings that we're asked to save and consider moving and, and. Uh, I work for a conservation authority, same thing, right? You know, it's, it's, you have area and space, you can put this, you know, yeah, this yeah. So it comes up from I, time to time. Curious, I don't love moving buildings, but uh, again, sometimes you, it's, you have to do it too. So. Yeah, if you can save them in place, that would be that would be great. Um, luckily, we haven't had the kind of situation they had for you know, like what created Upper Canada Village mm -hmm. was the flooding that because of the seaway, or what happened in Toronto with Black Creek Pioneer Village, partly because of flooding on the Don and the Humber, but also the city was growing. Um, Fanshawe Pioneer Village is in London, Ontario, and it's another place I love. I I, it, it, I don't know. I have this this affinity for uh, pioneer villages. But uh, when that first opened, they didn't have a lot of buildings to save. You know, London London hadn't taken off me. You opened up a park and then people found buildings to put on it. And you know what? In the past 25 years, they've done exactly that. They've they've moved buildings out there that were in danger of being, of being lost. And you know, London's a pretty, pretty big town and it's grown over the past uh, 30 years. So somebody was thinking ahead there that they set up this space to save important buildings in the in the greater London area, yeah. So, so I guess sort of a follow up from that uh, this uh, question from sort of the field um, was so if people wanted to, you know, what mechanisms are there? So you sort of alluded to that a little bit, but if somebody wanted, you know, wanted to have input or discussion about saving a property, um, and this question comes in from Bruce, if they wanted to save a property, how would you how would you recommend they go at that? Well, I'd say communicate directly with the commission. People write letters, send emails. Uh, they can they can go online and uh, and send uh, a message through. Um, other people have gone through their elected representatives too. You know, the mayors of the three municipalities along the river, and there's a, a regional representative as well. Uh, so they can go through their elected representatives too. So this is often where it starts. It's often not this top down thing. It is grassroots. And the more people learn about the significance and importance of a place, uh, you know that 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 will kind of builds over time to make sure it's it's saved and and protected. Um, and I think uh, the people who live in Fort Erie and, and Niagara Falls and Niagara Lake can get a lot of the credit. They're the ones who started marking these places and acknowledging these places as as important. So hopefully we we carry on that tradition. Okay, great. Um, I want to get back. I'm actually going to start the slideshow. And as, as I sort of mentioned at the top, I sort of put together a few pictures of, of things that we would uh, maybe talk about. And this was sort of leads into my next phase um, of the talk was was about some of those. Well, there's Laura Secord. You sort of talked about that already. So so maybe I want to I want to get into a little bit like, you know, things like the Queenston Chapel. This is a relatively new acquisition, isn't it? So, yeah. So this, this church, uh, this Methodist meeting house built in the 1860s sat on Queenston Street, which really was the main street in, uh, in the village, still is the main street in the village of Queenston. And, uh, and then when the parkway was put through, I guess the early 30s, uh, bypassed the village. Uh, and at that point, the people at the Methodist church uh, acquired some land, uh, dug a basement for their Sunday school, uh, move the church and and put uh, an extension on the back and then put an, a little extension on the front as well. And that would have been in the late 50s they did that. And then a few years ago we thought, well, we were hosting more and more events at this church. What if we kind of brought it back to its earlier look? Because we had lots of photographs. There's plenty of photographs of, of what this place looked like originally. Uh, and we we moved it over to the Lower Seacourt Homestead. So it's made it safer, it consolidated uh, parking. Uh, we did block the fire department a couple of times based on where the church used to sit. So it's just been better relationship maybe for the firefighters. Uh, opened up a little parkland on, on the parkway 
uh, and and it's just made it more accessible and more practical for hosting uh, hosting events. So it's, it gets a lot. So it's on the Lower Secor property, basically, right? So, so it sits on the on the Lower Secor. I say it's the Lower Secor property, but I think technically it sits on land that the Secords never owned. <laughs> it's That's a big block. Yeah. Out past their backyard, basically. Yeah, so the other one, like people might not know, Bertie Hall, which was a dollhouse museum for quite some time, is still yeah. owned by the Parks Commission, and you guys have to maintain it and restore it. And, you know, what, 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 what do you have? What, what's the responsibilities there? And, you know, what are you, what are you guys doing with that space? Well, we've had it since 1982, okay. uh, gifted to us by the Ontario Heritage Foundation at the time, now the Trust, who are also great people. Uh, they're another crew of folks I really like working with as, as and they're mainly known to people in Ontario by as the people who put up the blue and gold plaques. You know, they're the ones who put up the provincial plaques, but they're they're a great uh, group. House has been there since the early 1830s. Uh, a lot of Niagara Falls history here. Uh, you know, this is William Forsyth, one of the one of the great uh, <laughs> great uh, entrepreneurs, yeah. entrepreneurs, yes, yes. and businessmen of Niagara Falls who who uh, ended up moving here. Um, yeah, fascinating guy, uh, Forsyth. The young architect is an American guy who uh, who's living in Drummondville at the time. Uh, now I, I I'm going to screw up. Am I going to screw up my Niagara Falls history? Your neighborhood. By I think we're in Drummondville. We're right? in Drummondville. We're in Drummondville. So uh, uh, so we're pretty sure that Forsyth engaged him to uh, to design this Greek revival. Very American looking house, actually. This is yeah. you're going to find most of this in the States, but the same designs go into uh, to uh, Willowbank, which is now the School of Restoration Arts, and also uh, out in Cayuga, help me out here, Clark. Um, that's right, yeah, Ruthven. So same era, same designer, pretty sure. Uh, he, he's definitely worked on the others, but we, uh, we haven't told- The last shot that he gets uh, mixed into whether he was a designer or architect or builder, it becomes a, a little bit of a new one. Right. Right, right. So a relatively young guy in the early 1830s, but we think this might have been one of his first kicks at the cat. We just don't have a, a hard and fast. So this was a big prominent landmark in Fort Erie. A number of different families owned it. And uh, um, yeah, the, the, the Fenian raid sort of went past here. Uh, it was a, a the, you know, the dollhouse gallery was there and it sort of became the place also to tell the, the history, uh, black history in, in Fort Erie. For, for many years. Currently, for those who are interested, it's it's storing our archives. So we we put a new roof on it a couple of years ago, and we also redid the HVAC in there and uh, and security and and fire systems, and uh, and that's where our archives are currently being being housed. So so it has life. It has a purpose. Uh, it just doesn't have the same public role it had uh, as the. As a dollhouse gallery. Let's loop around and, and check it out the same way. Yeah. yeah. So another one I, I brought up when we were talking, because this is a neat little, again, I want to look at the scope of what you guys have to deal with in contrast. And again, you can see the contrast between, you know, wooden dark, you know, wooden columns and <laughs> That's right, yeah. framework. And then you go into this type of thing, which is a neat little thing that sits, you know, just down in Queenston Heights and uh, welcomes you into the park. And, um, but, you know, talk about the gatehouse a little bit and what, you know, what that, uh, you know, conservation heritage-wise, what do you have to do with it there? Yeah, the gatehouse is uh, is a neat building, and and so many people don't even know they've driven past it thousands of times because you're kind of whipping around that bend in the parkway and you don't really notice it. The fact so you have to be able to on the right, right? So <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So we, you know, I I'm not quite sure when we added the garage and the kitchen on the back of it. So it's it's kind of got this. Uh, uh, not very attractive addition on the back of it. And clearly the gates are no longer attached to the gatehouse. Um, the gates are still there, uh, but the, the house, uh, the house is where it's always been. It's the gates that moved and probably moved a couple. I was scratching my head when I was putting together some of the photos. Okay. I was, okay. Yeah. So you have to think that the, the house hasn't moved. It's had some additions. It's had a porch put on the front, which would be on the left side as you're looking at the picture. And then a garage and a, and a, laundry room and kitchen dinette was sort of added 
uh, at the back, which faces the parkway. So it's kind of camouflaged by that. That because uh, the gates are shifted up the hill a little bit, right? So, you, you got it. Yeah, and, and it all oh, comes sure, down how maybe it tops. Yeah, it's all how people visit and how they got here. So really, this is built when the current Brock's Monument is built. So if I word this right, this might be <laughs> the first purpose-built parks management building in Canada. It wasn't somebody's house. It wasn't an old building or town hall or factory. It was built for the purpose of, of, of maintaining Queenston Brock's Heights. Monument in Queenston Heights. So this predates the creation of the of the Parks Commission, and of course back then you would have been coming up the old Portage Road, right? Uh, Almost the same way we're doing it now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this predates um, well rail lines going through. It predates um, although there are railroads in Niagara by by this period, but it, the, the the little uh, gorge route that would have taken people up from the village uh, didn't exist yet. The Parkway didn't exist yet. So the Portage Road is really running right in front of this place. Um, and then the gates get moved to accommodate it. A train station is, is put in place to accommodate all the visitors coming on the ferries and boats from Toronto. Uh, of course, the bridge is built. Uh, 1850s, the Queenston Lewiston Suspension Bridge is built. So you have even more people coming up, up the heights that way. Uh, the railways coming through in the 1850s, just not to this to this point. The inside of this place is neat. It's a neat, great little place. It's we rented it out to uh, to families. It was a rental property, and right now it hasn't really got a got a a, a, a purpose right now. So that's something we talk about from time to time. We got to give this give this place uh, some life and give it a uh, give it a purpose. Yeah. So the Niagara Lake doors open. For a drive down the, the, the Parkway. Niagara Lake doors open site. You know, it'd be a neat little doors open site. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a beautiful little building and sturdy, <laughs> pretty solid. It has no basement per se. There is a little bit of one, but it's, uh, it's literally built on the side of the Heights. So the next time somebody's out for a drive in the parkway and you've never noticed this, this place, keep, don't, don't lose control of your car on that bend, but, uh, it's in a neat spot. If somebody just want to know the address. Basically, it's at the bottom of Queens. It's it's. Uh, That's right. It's uh, God. What would you say the address is? It's the Parkway. When you, if you don't know it, you're looking on the Parkway. If you're looking up that uh, pathway that goes to, you know, frames Brock's monument beautifully. That's right. right. Yeah, that's it. That's it. It's right, right there. And those gates are still there. They've just been moved, centered right over top of, uh, of the walkway. And if you use the bike route, if you use the bike path that also comes up along the back of it, that, that bike path was the rail line. So that, that was a railway bed for the, uh, the gorge route that came, came up from the village. Uh, and that, that stopped operating 1932, something like that. But yeah, it's one of my favorites. Just a great little, great little building. And again, what, what I like about this, it shows the scope. Like, like you guys have to maintain these. Again, back to the principles of the parks and internet, you know, not being pro or anti parks commission, but again, the reality <laughs> of the cost, again, I know the cost of, of maintaining these things, right? You know, the yeah. work and the woodwork and the trim and all that type of thing. So, so uh, we yeah, we've got some big, really neat properties that uh, people don't recognize that, that you, you, you guys are caring for. And from time to time, we have the public remind us, hey, are you going to do anything with this? And, and you think, yeah, man, they're right. We, we, uh, not that we've forgotten about it, but when you're around something a lot, <laughs> you don't know. You're worried about day to day stuff. You're worried about what's happening. That's itself. right. You maybe don't notice that. And some of those markers, you know, we had a gentleman politely point out that some of those markers that were put up by that literary society were really becoming illegible. Uh, and I think we have four of them uh, that are sort of little pieces of history themselves from the early 20th century. And uh, yeah, I think maybe you you put us on to some folks who did some restoration work in the cemetery, uh, Lundy's Lane. And yeah, they did a fantastic job, totally brought those back to life. Great. So, you know, we have a lot of great people in house, but every once in a while we reach out to uh, the experts who can, uh, who often do a fantastic job. A lot of interesting trades you need to, need to rely on and get the expertise from for sure. Yes, yeah, yeah.
Yeah. But again, people don't think of these heritage properties as things that we see every day, but you know, this building is an impressive building. Again, right now it's in many ways covered with a lot of awnings and a few other alterations <laughs> to the property and drive yeah. traffic attention and, and all that. But at the heart of it, this building is still there. And uh, it is. Piece. So the Queen Victoria uh, Place restaurant, this, uh, this is a neat building. Uh, and, you know, it's 100 and, almost 120 years old. So we kind of forget how <laughs> we live with these buildings. You kind of forget how, how old they are. So we are, we've talked about the different, in the past, the different eras of, of looks in the park. So we started off with rustic. Everything was going to be rustic. Sort of these cedar built little rest stops. Uh, we were going to get back to nature. And then when the hydro plants go through, we have all this river stone. So we go through a river stone period where, uh, man, we build everything with river stones uh, and, and including uh, Victoria Park. The refectory, for, for people who may be listening and watching, they may remember calling it or may have worked at the refectory uh, and also a place where the commissioners lived. Uh, so, you know, that upper level with those dormers there, though, that was a series of apartments where uh, commissioners who lived out of town. Well, we had fewer commissioners and probably traveling by rail. Uh, well, a TV question coming in from Hamilton. It's a, it's a full day trip at least, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're, you've got a place to stay uh, for, uh, for the commissioners. And you know, the back of the building, if you ask the staff, it's still called the commissioner's quarters. <laughs> Although it hasn't been the commissioner's quarters in a very, very, uh, very long time. I think a lot of people have memories of weddings in the commissioner's quarters. You can rent the space. And that bit that sticks up on the left side there, there's a really neat room up there too. Sort of another floor up that we used as the park sort of training room for years. And the view from there is just spectacular. So it's a, it's a, a neat building that speaks to that era, that first decade of the 20th century. And we had all that river stone to, uh, to build. It does job. This is a beautiful little piece, right? And it, it it's does, fantastic. It, yep. It's great. You know, I think, I think there is a style that the Parks Commission, on the scale that they did it, there's enough of a sequence of things that you can sort of pick up the, the uh, aesthetic and the style of the era. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And, the, uh, and I, think, I think when we talked about this earlier, I went, went through these quickly with, with Jim. We sort of talked about, you know, the other thing is Rambler's, uh, Rambler's Rest down the way. So, you know, again, that, that, that wonderful little poster on the corner. Again, you know, the, 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 you know, sweet little place that just sort of uh, personifies what the Parks Commission was at that time. Yeah, and it, it had a slightly larger cousin uh, that's been gone probably for over 40 years now. And that was Inspiration Point. So to a certain generation of people, we have people ask about Marilyn Monroe and the making of the movie Niagara, and they assume it's Rambler's Rest. It was, they actually used the start of the motel that they built as a movie set was actually built around in the, one at the, the sheltered Inspiration Point. But all of these buildings date from the same era. In Dufferin Islands, there's the last of the little police huts. And again, these were all built in the first few years of the, uh, of the 20th century. Um, neat space. And then we get into this era of, uh, of Queenston limestone and iron. And, and out of that comes really the rest of the, a, a good chunk of the 20th century. Uh, so you get the 1920s version of Table Rock House. Uh, you get Oaks Garden Theater in the 1930s. So that's where we go to this... Uh, this classier look maybe with cut limestone and, uh, and iron. And you've got the railings there. Yeah. We decided that's Prime Minister Nehru, you said? Uh, on the right, yeah, doing right. something illegal, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and those, so we've had the, that design of railings been around uh, for well over a hundred years. Uh, you know, our welding shop is still fabricating and maintaining the same, the same look uh, and you know, one of the guys who in the 30s and 40s did amazing decorative uh, work was a friend of T.B. McQuesson's and really a Hamilton guy, Frederick Flatman, and really an artist. I mean, the stuff this guy did, and a lot of it, not all of it, but I'd say most of it uh, survives. Oaks Garden Theater has some of his work. Uh, the next time anybody goes past the Botanical Gardens in the School of Horticulture, check out the gates, the old gates that take you to the school, the old school building. Uh, that's his handiwork. There's decorative pieces in the botanical gardens, like the wishing well. 
uh, that's all his his uh, his handiwork. So we've tried to maintain uh, even that that era of uh, of really these artisans who did this all by hand. So mm -hmm. back to the responsibility of maintaining uh, all of that yeah, and expertise and yeah. So so a lot of that you maintain in house. I think we were talking. You know, your guys try and do what they can and and maintain along the way and. Uh, and we've disappointed. Uh, what's the difficulty? You know? Like I, again, you know, and, and I think we had a conversation before, you know, a couple of days ago, and you know, you've got 14 million people going through here, and this railing has to be maintained and everything else. So, so what are the challenges with some of these these, you know, again, large volumes of people going through here? And uh, is, is there a challenge there, or you guys uh, just have to stay on top of it? Well, I don't want to. I don't want to misrepresent our engineering department, who does a ton of work. But you know, you've got a, a part. The core of it is in the mist zone. Mm -hmm. uh, so our, our roads department is constantly, you know, anybody who travels the roads here in the wintertime knows the parkway is usually pretty good. <laughs> and that's because it's always snowing. It's always freezing rain. So our road crews, they don't work when it snows, they work all the time. So you put ironwork, uh, automotive glass in that mist, uh, you know, things deteriorate. The, the mist is like a fine grit um sandpaper basically uh so not only do you have the corrosive effect of water but you have this grinding away uh on every surface so you've got to you've got to stay on top of that and just your the sheer volume of traffic you know just maintaining sidewalks uh and pathways um that's an ongoing ongoing thing to keep those maintained uh and it's canada you know thing <laughs> we get we get shifting weather conditions uh, so the falls and its mist can be can be pretty harsh. So it's a it's a challenge that every time I talk to our, our, our folks in engineering, you know, they they take it on as a as a, as an honor. You know, they take it very seriously, maintaining the park. And then beyond that, also part of our our, our horticulture staff also have some maintenance roles beyond what we maybe think of maintaining the the gardens and the and the lawns. So even they have a role. Uh, in maintaining some of the pathways. Um, and then in all of that is keeping everybody safe. So I think the, I think the falls at wintertime is gorgeous, but obviously it comes with hazards when, when people want to get out and, and walk around, which we want them to do. So uh, that's, that's all part of it, trying to keep people safe and still maintaining that, that look. And as you can see with Prime Minister Nehru, we get a lot of questions about, you just let people do that? Well, we don't want you to stand up on that parapet like he's doing, but as you know, Clark, people do it uh, every day. So, <laughs> and we'll continue to do it. And if you, you know, you put one measure in, they're going to find another way to do it. So that's right. That's right. So I think for considering the millions of people who come every year and lean on that railing to enjoy the view, it, it does. It's it's been doing its job for a very very long time. So. So, you know, I, I think, you know, I think I, I want to sort of wrap up with this. Uh, I think this is, no, I got one more actually after okay. this. But, you know, talk about, you know, Victoria Park itself was the foundations for everything. And, and this, I've shifted this a little bit because I think there's some neat changes around this space and, and what you sort of had to deal with and work with and, and Oaks Garden Theater and certainly there was a huge gateway. But just so, uh, you know, we had a bit of a discussion about, you know, the challenges of the space and what evolution happened here and maybe where it's going in the future. Yeah, I, I um, you know, I should mention, and, and Sherman Zavitz would want me to mention, he's still the Niagara Parks uh, historian because we don't talk a lot about the hotels that were there. And it still amazes me, maybe that's one picture I should have said, because just the scale of the Clifton hotels, unbelievable for their time. And you think this, this was built, the first one was built in the 1830s. Um, and basically filled the block that that Oaks Garden Theater sits in now pretty much filled it. Um, so, you know, that was the hotel uh, for for in its two different versions anyway for a century. Um, and really the creation of Oaks Garden Theater came out of that land, you know, people realizing that needed to be parkland that, that it wasn't going to be continue to be a hotel. But of course, Mother Nature often has different plans. So you build this gorgeous gateway with this memorial arch and a and this this cool Art Deco gift shop and these gardens, and then the bridge falls down. <laughs> yeah. 
So I don't think anybody planned on the the upper steel arch bridge or the honeymoon bridge uh, collapsing and then boom, you're into building another bridge that goes right over top of the parkway and totally changes the traffic patterns. But it does introduce the Rainbow Gardens, which is a nice addition to uh, Oaks Garden um, Theater. So there's always that challenge. And then access down to the old ferry, the Maid of the Mist or Hornblower. And in the images there, you've got the old, uh, well, cliff, we'll down here. Yeah. which is, we both agree was a pretty neat building. So the incline that went back into service that the Hornblower folks uh, put back in service is sitting on the bed of the 1890s incline. And that road, that access road has been there a very, very long time. Can you imagine bringing uh, a horse and carriage up that road? Yeah, yeah, to, to run people across the river before there were bridges. Um, so it's, it's a neat piece of real estate. Just the sheer volume of people coming down Clifton Hill and crossing over uh, to get that view. You know, there's some safety concerns that you talked about, traffic flow, vehicle traffic, uh, interfering with pedestrian traffic. I think over time we've tried to lean towards the pedestrians and public transit and even experimenting which we have on Canada Day the past few years, just shutting down that park, the parkway basically from, um, from the base of Clifton Hill all the way out to Fraser Hill, which is the, the entrance to the Big Falls uh, parking lot. Um, and, and I think it's our current mayor who, I'm gonna misquote uh, uh, the mayor who, who went down there and won Canada Day and said, you, it really felt like the community and the park was reconnected to the river. You know, you really felt like it was it was connected again. So, bit of an experiment. And as you also may know, we we did permanently block off one lane for the northbound traffic from Table Rock up to uh, up to Murray Hill. And I think for all kinds of good reasons, that's that's worked out for for me. It's just safer now, and and easier for people to walk in the winter time. Um, it's just a safer, uh, safer spot for pedestrians. Right, right. And you guys got, and actually just about, I saw someone raise a hand, I can't get in there, but if you do have a question, use the Q and A and ask a question there and uh, we'll try and get it in. So if you do have a, uh, I think it was, it was Lewis actually had his hand up, but just uh, throw your question in the Q and A if you have a question. And, uh, but, but before we get off of this, you guys are looking at a new master plan for Victoria Park. Where, where, where are you guys at with that? And sort of what are the considerations you guys are looking at right now? Well, I, th I think, again, there's always been this issue of, of, uh, of traffic flow and uh, how to make it easier for people to use like the WeGo system and transit and, and try to limit the, uh, where cars are going and where buses are going. Um, you get a lot, not just the safety aspects, but I think just the, the ambient noise of all the traffic can, can kind of take away from maybe the park experience. So, you know, there, there have been a couple of public meetings about, uh, and I think there was some good input from the community about how they viewed that part of the park. Um, you know, the cenotaph, the city's cenotaph is on Clifton Hill and that section of roadway is actually the city's. We have discussions about maintaining it and, and access to it. Um, and every, every November 11th, they do bring wreaths down uh, to, to there. They don't have a ceremony there. Um, but they, uh, they, it's still actively used as a part of that. So uh, that's, that's part of the challenge too. About this is, this is a park that's for everybody, but it's connected to the community too. The community is the year round user of the, of the park in a way. And, you know, we've put up gates. <laughs> you can see, you can see Moat Gates at the bottom left hand photograph there. Uh, they've been moved up to Falls, up to Falls Ave, <clears throat> up Clifton Hill a little bit. Um, but we don't want this to be a gated place. You know, there, there needs to be that kind of open traffic between the community. A gateway, but not a gate. Exactly. A gateway, but not a gate. That's, that's an excellent way of, uh, of, of putting it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There, there's a good question sort of tied in. Oh, that's uh, from Patrick. Uh, um, and we're in the sort of this, I'll jump in right now because it's sort of in these, these, uh, these, these photos. So he'd like to know why no pedestrian access is allowed on the hairpin road down to the Hornblower dock area. I presume there's some safety concerns there, but. 
yeah, we've got a lot. We got a lot going on there, <laughs> and uh, and there's people who went down there and fished for years, and they're not real real pleased with access. But I think once the uh, hornblower is, uh, frankly, up until this year, was seeing more traffic uh, on their boats than the Maid of the Mist. Uh, this year is obviously different, and of course we opened up the zip line that that bring people down to. Uh, what was the north entrance of uh, the Ontario power plant. So uh, just people coming back up that road from the zip line and even access, uh, I think our police have wanted to make sure there was emergency access down to uh, the docks at Hornblower because obviously it's an important access point. Um, if there's rescues or, or someone's in the river, uh, they really need to be able to get down there in a, in a hurry. So they put up more restrictions that uh, that limits uh, people. So I know there's been a concern from people who are fishing in the river that maybe we're, we're limiting access, but generally these things come down to, to public safety, even though, yeah, that, that road has been there a very long time and people would have had, had access to it. Great. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm going to well, the last thing that I think we sort of want to cover a little bit is certainly the biggest sort of the most ambitious in certainly in your, your time with the Parks Commission's project. So again, there's three power plants that uh, Parks Commission is the, um, I want to say the, uh, I guess, owner of. Or the, <laughs> we are, yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> I was thinking of a, of a more uh, a better but I'll Caretakers, with, caretakers. Caretakers was sort of yeah. what I was thinking. So. So again, due to, and the Parks Commission had a role to play in them actually being there too. So, so certainly part of the history as well is, is providing access to these newfangled things to generate power through water and uh, create clean energy. So, you know, so, uh, you know, you've got three properties, certainly the Rankin one is the big one that you guys are, are working hard at. So maybe sort of give people a sort of an update on where you are with that and maybe talk about the other two too as well afterwards. Well, I think the uh, the Canadian Niagara Power Plant or the William Rankin uh, generating station, it's uh, of the three, it's slightly older than the other two. It's the most intact. Um, and even the where, it, where it's positioned makes it more accessible to people. It's right near a parking lot. It's uh, it's on our- It's not the middle of the gorge where you can't get down to. Yeah, exactly. Like, like Ontario Power is the most accessible. And before we, uh, uh, were given the keys to Toronto Power, Ontario Power, they were gutted of everything. OPG kind of pulled everything up. But Fortis, who owned Canadian Niagara Power, uh, if you live in Fort Erie, you get your hydro bill from Canadian Niagara Power still. Uh, man, they they really love this old plant. So when we took it over, the brass was polished and it was beautiful. So uh, now we're really pushing ahead. You know, last fall, a year ago, we, uh, we participated in uh, Doors Open and we, we had a couple thousand visitors go through. And that was, I think that inspired people. Uh, the positive comments we got from people who were so in awe of just being allowed to go in the place. It's just massive and it's beautiful. <laughs> it is, it is. They were really, you know, they understood that they, they were upsetting people by building these industrial buildings and in what had just become a park. You know, people didn't, you know, hand over their lands, uh, to find out it was going to be turned into the into these big industrial facilities. So they were built to look nice. You know, they built them to look timeless. And they also built them to impress people because they could, wanted to convince people to sign up for hydro. So there was, a, there was sort of method to the madness too that it had to fit into a park-like setting. One thing that you won't notice is there's no hydro lines running from any of these buildings. There's no, there's no power lines. They're all underground. And that was deliberately done. So it wouldn't sort of mess up the, mess up the view. So they built these buildings, uh, maybe a little bit of competition about how grand they were gonna look. So Toronto Power has that classical kind of look where uh, um, this is, this is a, a more Romanesque kind of more solid arches uh, kind of- More kind of, purposeful. More purposeful maybe. Yeah, but you know, everything from the green tile roof. To oh, it's a beautiful building, yeah. The marble they use, it, it, it's, they went out of their way to- the Doors it, and yeah, absolutely. And the so it, it, it's a neat place. 
and it tells an, an amazing story and it adds to the story of Niagara Falls. You know, all those things I mentioned about the importance of the river and the falls to people for thousands of years. Well, here's an even another reason that we're generating power. Uh, and the power plants that still operate have the capacity to power you know, almost 3 million homes. So it's still, it's still doing, its, uh, doing its job. But what I'm always amazed with, when you look at the photographs of this plant when it's being built, nobody invented a truck. <laughs> so everything's being hauled away by horses. 1904, I think is the, the opening. Yeah, it, they, they break around in 1901 and, they, and, it, and it is generating electricity technically in January of 1905. The whole plant as it sits isn't really entirely completed with all of its generators in place till 1927. Uh, and by then Beck one down river is, is up, and, up and running. So it, it tells an amazing story. It speaks to an era. Uh, it really speaks to the whole 20th century. This plant ran for over hundred years and uh, it really covered most of the 20th century. So, and the people who worked there took great pride in, in what they did and, and in maintaining this really incredible building. Of course, the bridges out front of it have their own great story. And we've done some restoration work on the, on the road bridge and even the little bridge that used to have the, uh, the ice uh, rake that would, this little electric locomotive that would, would uh, clear ice away from the outer uh, four bay or the access to the outer four bay. That's now a, a pedestrian path that gets a lot of use. The one thing that's missing that we talk about whether we'd ever recreate it, this had an icebreaker. So in the four bay, there was a little boat and it was, uh, it had a power line to it from the plant. And this thing would sort of in the winter time motor around inside the, uh, the, uh, the, the outer four bay breaking up ice. Cause ice was really the thing these guys were fighting all the time uh, through a Canadian winter to keep the plant uh, operating. And, and this plant was pretty- You power the water, but then you stop it almost. Yeah. It's gonna freeze. So you yeah. gotta be cognizant of that. And you don't wanna muck up the turbine. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So they, they learned a lot as they were building these plants. It's sort of like computer technology or, or, or smartphone technology today. As you built one, you realize, you know, you're, you're going to have to build another one because, you know, you, you've got more and more powerful uh, generators and, and better ways of transmitting electricity. And so the fact it operated for that long is, is a testament to the hard work of the people who, uh, who built it and then the people who maintained it. So it's neat. So hopefully this- So where, where are we at with this project now? Well, we're, it's going to be in stages. Yeah, certainly it's a weird, weird year, so we know that. Yeah, we're, we're kind of in year one. So we want to be able to open the doors next summer. The, the commission is committed to opening the doors next summer again. Uh, a, a little bit limited in scope because when we opened it last year, we had to get special permission to allow people in there. I mean, it's a, it's a early 20th century industrial building. So it creates some safety issues that we're trying to maintain the building in its interior as much as we can, but to let people in, the modern rules kind of start uh, coming in. You can say, well, it's- I uh, talk to my shins. I get a little bit of concern on the second floor. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a historic site. You shouldn't have to, to change anything, but in some cases you do. You do have to change a few things. So the first stage will really bring people onto the main floor. Uh, but I think there's some neat surprises about displays and explaining how the plant was built. So there'll be a bit of, for the history buff, there'll be stuff. For the electricity buff, there'll be uh, something there. And we're talking about doing an evening sound and light show inside uh, that I think will be the attraction that will draw people in. The later stages will be to let people go down into the wheel pit and even down into the tail race tunnel. Fantastic. And that is the cool factor, I think. That you walk into the building and you're like, holy cow, this is huge. And you realize you're looking at 20% of the building, right? The rest of it's all underground. Uh, and then you have this huge tail race tunnel that goes for 600 meters from the plant and empties out in a tunnel that uh, probably people watching tonight know about, but most visitors don't notice is this huge tunnel that comes out right next to the platform for, for uh, Journey Behind the Falls. Uh, nobody ever notices it because there's something distracting them. This, the humongous waterfall probably is what's distracting them. So 
Uh, but this plant, again, it, it was the one that was most intact. Uh, the machinery they put in at the beginning of the 20th century was still working uh, 100 years later. So that's uh, with a lot of maintenance uh, in that 100 years, but essentially the same core equipment was in place and still providing electricity. The same knobs and pulleys and, and gears. And yes. Gears. Yeah. 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 It's a neat space. It's a fun space. I'm not a huge industrial historian, but this is, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my visit there last yeah. year. Good, know. good, good. So you got, so you got two other, other massive plants as well. Is there any, anything sort of, I, I'm sure lots of ideas, probably nothing concrete. Is that sort of where you're at? I think that's where we're at right now, that the goal is to to structurally maintain them. The, the, that, that, that's a big challenge with buildings that big. big. Challenge with the Toronto one too, yeah. Uh, to be frank and fair, you know, this building was in pretty good uh, shape when it was handed to us, where Toronto Power, or the Electrical De Development Company, you know, that it had shut down as a power plant uh, in 1974. And then in the early 2000s, OPG started pulling everything out of it. Same with the Ontario power plant down below. Um, so that that's a bit of an issue just, and then where they're located. So both Toronto power and Ontario power are right on the river. That creates a, a different issue as, as well. Um, currently we've got, and if you haven't had a chance to go down, you should go have a look. The four bay at Canadian Niagara power is dry. You know, we put up a coffer dam basically uh, like they did when they built the place and uh, and it's it's dry where the other two being right on the river creates all sorts of uh, added challenges and then access right so just as that road isn't as accessible as it used to be getting people down into the into the plant and that doesn't mean there aren't creative ways to get people down there but there's nothing in them to show people right now so if you're a power plant fan there's Every, all of its working mechanisms are are gone. It's a, it's a shell basically at this stage. It's a shell. Pretty cool shells, but uh, there's there's nothing left. Unlike CMP, which is which is virtually uh, the way it was when they were finished operating. Great. All right. Well, I, I, I'm going to sort of end it at that, Jim. I, and again, I, I I think for the people at home, I just wanted to provide a, a little bit of a glimpse at some of the things that that people might not know about. Obviously, I think Rankin has had a lot of focus over the last, uh, you know, certainly three, four or five years, um, but at least bring them up to speed with that. So um, I wanted to, I hope the people at home sort of uh, got a sense of the scale and the scope of what you guys are dealing with on the heritage side. I haven't seen any other, we had a few questions come in, we sort of dealt with those. So at this point, I think, I think I'm gonna wanna, wanna just sort of wrap it up then. Um, and wanna thank you, Jim. Uh, I, I think certainly I, I wanna thank you for for spending time with us and sort of going through some of these neat little properties and, and big properties and uh, uh, sort of giving us some scope and, and depth and I uh, uh, really appreciate your time tonight, so. Thanks Clark, thanks for having me, this was fun. Thanks Jim. Uh, I'm just gonna wrap it up quickly before we sign off. Um, I just wanna sort of uh, let people know we've got more great programming. Oh, do we have another? Oh, I had another question coming in last minute. Oh, it was just Patrick saying thanks too. Well, you're welcome Patrick. Um, so I just want to sort of uh, mention we got a lot of other great programs coming up. Uh, we've got some great series tied in with our current exhibitions, uh, Black History Book Club. Um, I think we've got our, our ongoing film series is going on. So hopefully you check those out. Lots of great Thursday night programming. The other thing I'm going to point out is on Thursdays, we have extended our hours again. We've, uh, we're going to be staying open on Thursdays till eight. So looking back to uh, getting people back in here and opportunities access the great exhibitions we have here. Uh, we've got two wonderful exhibitions in here. Uh, the place is safe, we've kept it clean. We're doing regular uh, cleaning reg uh, uh, routines here. And uh, we really wanna encourage you to get out here if you have an opportunity. Again, we recognize these are interesting times and it's, uh, it, it's not, uh, not necessarily always uh, that you don't wanna come see us. So we re recognize you wanna stay safe, but we have, uh, uh, and we rise, uh, an exhibition that we've matched also with uh, North is Freedom, which is a wonderful uh, photographic journey looking at the Underground Railroad in contemporary terms. So two great exhibitions we have open. We're open Tuesday, Saturday these days, uh, 10 to 4. But like I said, Thursdays, we're now open till 8 o'clock. So hopefully come on out and check us out. Uh, again, one, Jim, one last time, thank you very much for joining us. And we'll see you guys again. Take care.
Take care, Clark. If I can remember how to turn this off. <laughs> Stop the share. There we go. All right. Take care. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>